I get it, you are muted. Welcome everybody to Secrets of Closing the Sale. Glad to have you on board. So when we want to close the sale, are there any Jedi mind tricks? If you think back to the first Star Wars movie, you know, these aren't the droids you're seeking. Did something like that happen? Or in other words, how do you close the sale? Since we didn't have a Halloween session, I thought I'd, I'd share with you a little Halloween trivia. You know that saying, I turn back if I were you? You know where that comes from? It was popularized in a 1930s movie that started out in black and white and moved to color. You probably guessed it, The Wizard of Oz. So that's our Halloween thought. And I guess if you're in the haunted forest with the witch, you need luck. So let's talk about the role of luck in selling and in closing the sale. Is sales success a matter of luck? As a case history, let's look at the race to the pole, the South Pole, in 1911. There were two teams that went to the South Pole, a British team led by uh, Scott and a Norwegian team led by Amundsen. And as you can see, they both got there. Let me uh, enlarge this for you. But Amundsen got there almost over a month earlier. So the question is, was it luck that he got there? Let's take a look at some of the key facts. Preparation and training were essential to success and even to survival. So what are some of the things that Amundsen, the Norwegian did, the guy who got there first? He started 60 miles closer to the South Pole, which meant he went through a very difficult sea passage to get there. This was critical. He, he trained with Eskimos to learn cold weather survival techniques. So he lived amongst them, learned how to um, you know, eat blubber, for instance, and made the important decision to get dogs to use dog sleds to travel. Whereas by comparison, Scott used snowmobiles. And those snowmobiles broke down and Scott's team had to drag, they had to drag the, <laughs> the sleds as a result. Amundsen brought 10 times the amount of supplies per person of Scott's team. And he buried many supply depots along the route. Whereas Scott only had one supply uh, depot on the way back. Amundsen started two weeks earlier and he did what's called the 20 mile march. Every day they marched 20 miles, no matter what the weather was like, they were always marching 20 miles. Now they both had the same good and bad luck, blizzards. Well, not only did Amundsen get to the pole first, but there was a sad ending to the story. Every member of Scott's team died, including Scott. We know what happened because of a journal he kept that we found. So this is what's called um, a paired comparison. Both teams had the same good and bad luck, but only one survived. So there are four transformational words I could offer you to improve our luck. Bold vision, bold behavior, bold vision, bold behavior. Let me give you an indication of how that tied into closing the sale. So some time ago, I hired a new accounting firm and they invited me in one day to try and sell me a higher level product, like a tier two product, a cash flow planning product. And after the sale was over, I approached the name partner, Bert, and I said, Bert, is this how you guys normally sell? And he said, yeah, it was pretty good, wasn't it? And I said, well, I felt it needed work. I called him up a couple of weeks later and I said, Bert, you and your, your six partners, you need to hire me to teach you guys how to sell, you know, based on what I saw. <clears throat> this is a pretty crazy idea, right? Coming in and telling accountants, here's how you should sell. Well, they liked some of my ideas, so they invited me in and they said, uh, so tell me, Andy, have you ever trained a CPA firm before? And I said, no. Well, can you show us some testimonials for some success you've had? Said, no, no testimonials. You have some curricula a curriculum um, that you could show us as to what it would look like? No. Have you ever done this at any place at any time anywhere? Said, no. Then what makes you think you could do this? I said, it's simple. I saw your presentation. That's where it was. Here's where it should be. 
and I can close the gap. Pretty crazy, right? I mean, if you were a betting person, would you bet that this is gonna close? Probably not. Anyway, they liked my idea, so they brought me out on a sales call. My job was to zip my lips, look, listen, and we would debrief afterwards. So for the first um, hour of the sales call, I followed my instructions, but I couldn't take it anymore. So after an hour, I asked a question. Actually, I asked two questions and I closed the sale. And about a month later, they hired me. I worked with them for about six months. Accounting Today, which is a, um, a trade publication, wrote a front page story about uh, what, how I work with this accounting firm. You know, there's Bert over there and there's me when I was younger and handsomer. This webinar is about the two questions that I asked that closed the sale and launched this business. So what were those two, two, those quest, those two questions? We're gonna answer that a little later on. Let's look at closing and luck in the context of the standard sales call. If you set up the serious conversation in steps one to seven, if you then do your fact finding in eight to 12, then when you get to 13 to 18, you can prove your case and most importantly, close the sale. I, I give you this brief overview because closing doesn't take place in a vacuum. So here are the two steps. Step one, sounds like we have a fit, don't we? In effect, you know, we've talked about all these issues. You've told me one, two, three, four are important to you and uh, we've satisfied you. So it sounds like we have a fit. That's step one. To be discussed in our remaining time is step two, the hesitation question. Before we go there, how do we discover what makes us a fit? So we're looking for the effective use of these steps. Early fact finding, input your sales person. You do a good job, you come out as a consultant. Market research, if they're not talking, and you use your market research effectively, it gets them to talk seriously. The urgency step. You might have 100 facts you know going into it, coming out of it. Do you know the closing conditions? The set of conditions which when met, result in the sale. Then we have EBR, um, emotional buyer's response. The urgency is their reason, the output, what it means is the emotions. So we're focusing in on the urgency step as a precursor to closing the sale. In fact finding, you found out 100 different things, but now what you need is to narrow it down to the closing conditions. The series of conditions which when met would result in the sale. Now, why should prospects answer our questions? It's because we warm them up properly. We do our pre-call planning, including research. We send a good agenda, which helps us maintain focus and control. We do our bonding with a strong movement from social to business selling. We're humble, we wanna earn the right. We use a freebie, we give a free information that's not serving. We have a very strong statement about what we're known for, a condensed you know, uh, elevator pitch, and we set a good objective. So let's say you've done all these things as a precursor to getting the closing conditions, right? Because we got to meet the closing conditions. Once we know the names of the glasses, so we say that there are a series of invisible glasses on a prospect's desk, and our job is to name them and then fill them. So when we know what the glasses are, then we could fill them. And in the first step of the closing sequence, we said, it looks like we have a fit because we know these were your closing conditions or criteria, and we met those criteria. So the first step is discover and fill the glasses. The challenge we face is sometimes when we discover the names of the glasses, we can't meet all of the conditions or the conditions are commodity, plain vanilla. So when we ask the question, which we would ask, if I could meet these conditions or satisfy you on these points, would you be prepared to go ahead and you know, order from us and place the business with us? They might say no, because you're no different than the incumbent. So a critical part of your selling process, when you get to this point, is not only to test for a fit, but to test for uniqueness in closing. Because what we might need to do 
is move the conversation from red ink, which means we're going to lose, to uncontested space. And the way we discover that to a large extent is by asking another test question, if I satisfy you on these points, would you be prepared to go ahead? Well, let's say the conditions are too easy to meet. Let's say they give us closing conditions which the incumbent can meet. So it's not going to do us enough to meet these conditions. Then we need to add a glass with a what about question like, what about testimonials? Or what about an economic justification? By creating more customer wows through these techniques, we earn the right to close the sale. So we've tested for a fit. The customer agrees we have a fit. There's relatively uncontested space. We know that we have uncontested space. Now what? What's the final step for closing the sale? Well, before I show it to you, let me share with you an early lesson I had in closing the sale. Um, the alternate choice closed. You want it in red or you're, what, what you want it in blue. So my oldest daughter is two years old. My wife is working as a nurse per diem on the weekend. It's my job to take care of my daughter. And I have, because my, my wife is a nurse, I need to chart what happens, including how did she eat? So it's time for lunch, right? And I, I set out the food in the high chair. I put my daughter in the high chair, but now I got to get her to eat. So I say, honey, do you want to eat with a fork or a spoon? That's the alternate choice close. And uh, she said, a spoon. I said, yes. I, I can put in the chart, my daughter ate. And she did eat. So that was lunch. Now it's supper time. Do the same thing. Make dinner. Put her in the high chair. Put on the bib. I say to my daughter, honey, would you like to eat with a fork or a spoon? And she says, no. So what I learned from this experience, that if you haven't done this whole process, if you skip steps, and, and I did there, and you ask the alternate choice question, um, the answer is it works once with a two-year-old. So if you've done all the right steps, if you've warmed up the prospect, you've discovered the, 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 um, the closing conditions, and you fill the glasses, you prove them, it is time for the hesitation question. And this is it. It sounds like we have a fit, excuse me. The first question is, sounds like we have a fit, don't we? And then this is the hesitation question. What might cause you to hesitate in going forward? Now, this is a pattern interrupter. In fact, lots of what we do is a pattern interrupter. Why? Buyers, buyers are programmed to do what? They're programmed to say no. Would you like to buy? No. Would you like to buy more? No. Can I raise my price? No. Can I see you? No. And here, no means yes. So this is a very subtle technique. It's called the hesitation question. Is there anything that would cause you to hesitate in going forward? Sometimes when we sell, there's a hidden decision maker. Up front, we ask the buyer, is there anybody else who needs to be involved in this call? And they tell us no. So when, they, when we test for a fit and they say, yes, there's a fit, it means they agree. When we ask the hesitation question, we smoke out there's another decision maker. Another reason why the hesitation question is important is because it might cause the prospect to form a concept in their mind. So the, the different closing conditions, they could be like free floating abstractions. When we ask the hesitation question, they make a decision. So let's do a quick summary here. The, 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 the two-step process is, sounds like a fit, doesn't it? Sounds like we have a fit, don't we? And what might cause you to hesitate in going forward? Though that is the two-step process for selling the, uh, closing the sale when you've properly warmed up the prospect and you also have properly proved your case. And the hesitation question is a powerful um, pattern interrupter. Well, we all know Rome wasn't built in a day. So that before I made my final comments, think about your takeaways, if any, from today. What's your takeaway from today's short webinar? The two-step session, how you have uh, questions. Um, sounds like we have a fit, don't we? Is there anything that would cause you to hesitate in going forward? But importantly, how you build the foundation that comes before that. Our next webinar, we're going to skip, skip December, give you a holiday break is on 1.12 at 10.30 a.m. And our subject is um, how to prepare for a strong 2022. 
And the question that we're going to ask that's interesting is, uh, was once asked by a salesperson I coached who said to his boss, hey boss, it's only January 15th. We don't need to worry about sales, do we? Join us on, on January 12th at 10.30 a.m. to find out the answer to the question. And now I'll say goodbye for today. If you have any questions, please reach out to me, Andy G at urgencybaseselling.net or go to my website, www.urgencybaseselling.net. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.